This is GamesAtWork.biz, your weekly podcast about gaming, technology, and play. Your hosts are Michael Martin, Andy Piper, and Michael Rowe. The thoughts and opinions on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests alone and are not the opinions of any organization which they have been, are, or may be affiliated with. This is episode 460, Ask Emily Post, AI Etiquette? Good afternoon. Today is Friday, March 29th. I'm Michael Rowe, and I'm here to have fun talking tech with my good friends, Michael Martin and Andy Piper. And Andy, how the heck are you? Hi, Michael. Yes, I'm very well, thank you. It's been an interesting week exploring computer art again, and there's been a lot going on on the onlines and internets and news stories, as usual, that uh, trigger our spidey senses our techno- technological games at work. Biz Spidey senses that get us all interested. <laughs> Michael, how are you? Uh, I'm doing fine, Andy. It's and it's lovely to be together with both of you again. We have so many fun things to talk about today, and I'm excited to spend a, just a sliver of time with two of my favorite people. Um, Very sliver. So so to start Slivering. to start our sliver, <laughs> uh, and it's not shiver anymore because it's starting to get pretty darn warm here. Um, we have an article that came in from The Verge around the uh, a follow-up on one of the articles we had talked about, gosh, I guess it was last week or the week before, last about week. AI-generated music, right, with Suno. Yes. And w- not going through like this entire article and the treatment of it, but it's kind of cool stuff anyway, the, there were some elements of it that struck me, and I have to go back and think about how far, how far back it is in the prior episodes, that we talked about the notion of democratization of music, making it easier for anybody to create uh, musical content, and the drive to the average. So you remember that article that we had some while ago about things now being driven to the average, whether it was going to be design of uh, architecture and buildings, whether it was going to be colors, whether it was going to be automotive uh, or, 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 and well, we, we, we even talked about LLMs learning and being driven to average based off of learning from their own generated code. Yes. Yes. Well, and, and my, go ahead, Eddie. Well, there's a, there's a difference I think between Michael, what you just said about, um, yep. learning from their own code. So that's really entropy, right? Rather than driven to average, which is arguably done through consumption of large amounts of non-AI generated code or information, but leveling out to the, you know, the, the median values of that data set, right? Unless it's given yep. instructions to choose an angle that, that that is somewhere on that on the spectrum that is that is off average right so you can instruct your ai chatbot friend to provide information in a in a snarky style or a calm style or a, you know one of the ones that i've seen being mentioned this week actually has been um the fact that a lot of responses to posts on on the x network seem to be AI generated and, and using almost a Wikipedia medium kind yeah. of very factual, boring, if you like, tone. So I think there's a difference between that and the AIs feeding off what they've and learning from what they're generating themselves, which I classify as entropy. Now it would lead yeah. to some gray gooness of the outcut outputs because it would just become the same as what came before. But I think exactly. there's a difference. Well, where, where I really want to get both of your guys' experience on this, too, is that I, I see a danger here mm-hmm. of becoming uh, em, embubbleified, perhaps, you know, that <laughs> you, you, you listen to the music that you listen to. Like, Michael, right. you like your Ultravox, you know, and I mm-hmm. might like the B-52s. And I, you know, I, I, it's easy to get into um, a space where what will be served up to you will be variations on that theme. Mm-hmm. And I worry that that could be rather isolating in the end, unless there are steps taken, Andy, kind of like what you're suggesting about getting your AI friend to insert enough randomness in there to not only serve up to you what you already like, but to find and deliver adjacencies that you might like well, from there. It, 
and 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 we we talked about this gosh many 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 years ago and it came back up very recently on the music genome project right um where where yes i like ultravox i like the buggles as an example uh, and uh the buggles were created uh by uh, god what was trevor something another who also did art of noise oh. who actually started and I've discovered this recently. There's like these threads from specific artists mm-hmm. in various different bands over a long period of time. And I find it funny that I actually enjoy all of them. Is, right. Is it, uh, it, and, and it's that music genome type concept of the DNA uh, that changes it. And in uh, kind of a corollary to that, I, I recently uh, got an album called uh, Color Him Father by the Winstons. Uh, which I had the LP. Ooh. And I've ripped it, uh, and they were a For archival one purposes album band. Originally, they've they've kind of reformed and done songs for for decades now. Um, but their claim to fame is that on the B side of their original song that went out uh, as a single. Uh, there's a 30 second drum bait drum beat, uh, drum break that is probably the most sampled drum break in modern R and B music. <laughs> it's like the lick and it's like, it just blows me away. Right. So, so, um, same type of that drum beat or break is something that goes all the way back to like the late 1960s, but it, kind of feeds through music to now. And so when you have this generated music, Mm -hmm. if you don't have that DNA plus that infusion to continue to evolve, as you're describing, Andy, you do end up in that gray goo. I just want to pulling all that. I just want to throw in purely based on your comment, Michael, about those threads in musical um, DNA and the connections between different bands, a really good show that, um, aired on BBC um, probably a decade ago now, or possibly even more, called Rock Family Trees. Um, The very first episode is all about Fleetwood Mac and how that band went through different iterations and, uh, you you know, various members left and came back and all those kind of things. But it's just fascinating, all these. They literally do it, uh, the, the graphics throughout the show where they show family trees and these different people moving between bands and things over time. Anyway. Um, and I am a fan of Fleetwood well, Mac, including some of their subgroups. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so there's some, there's some fun, fun, there's some fun stuff in there. I think you can probably find some of those older episodes possibly on YouTube um, these days. Yeah. Um, I think the, the randomness piece is, is also quite interesting. We know by now that the answer to all of that is to point a camera at some pendulums and just add, throw some random data in from those every now and then, and uh, you'll get something exciting and new. So, yeah, as as we learned from a prior episode. So, I, I'm glad. Thank you guys for enter, for entertaining the thought here. Uh, music is something that's so important to people. It's obviously very passionate, you know, a topic for all of us and for for many others. And I think it is a lovely lens to help people understand. Uh, n- not just generated art in the form of a visual experience or text, but we're going to see more and more auditory elements as well and where we go. So with that thought, we're moving on to another topic about a particular office that um, uh, is using a whole number of sensors and assistants to communicate with the people that go in it. And I was reminded a little bit of the conversations we had about the the Skype headquarters in Microsoft land about uh, the uh, the bubblers, you know, the water fountains that would talk to you. And the description here, I love this. It's, a, it's an API going into a large language model to create hilarious results depending upon what the sensors noticed. I love. What this. did you guys think of this? Well, I, I came across this because I re- received Dan Hon's uh, newsletter, and he wrote a very long uh, episode this week or entry in his newsletter series this week. But he did refer to this as well as to the uh, clock that that gives you a poem every minute that uh, Matt um, uh, Matt uh, Matt Matt has come up with. Whose name is that? Matt did. The Matt did. 
Um, how embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, um, this is a great this is a great article, and the thing I loved about it is that I hadn't considered the simplicity of this model that you can literally take yeah. a JSON, a bit of da- J- JSON formatted data that in this case, initially, when as he talks through this, just contains, you know, the current temperature and conditions, throws it to the to the LLM and says, you know, give me this back as a as a weather report and with, with some amuse some amusing kind of personality. Uh, and you know, the LLM is able to understand the two pieces of information that are coming from totally different contexts. Um, the, the, the raw data and the, the prompt and come up with something new. And I also love the way that they go on to say, okay, well, we've got these sensors. We've had these sensors. Now we're going to add vision, uh, using cameras and, and so on to, to try and figure out who's in the building or, or things like that. Um, and come up with this whole kind of personality that is shared with the team via Slack or, or whatever channel. So I do love this. I thought this was uh, quite a brilliant, brilliant way of using the technology, the LLMs, to do something creative and interesting and new. Because the only way that you would have been able to do something like this previously would have been to code every possible response. Right. Um, right. You know, yeah, you could mix and match them perhaps, but, you know, you would have a limited range of responses to something like this. Yeah, I I, I enjoyed uh, both the longer newsletter that you forwarded and I read through. Uh, I was glad we weren't going to go through all of its content in the show because it was pretty dense. Right. Uh, and I did enjoy it. Uh, but, uh, you know, Harper Reed's blog here, you know, I love the title of Musings from a Normal Person doing normal things uh and then he does this really cool thing that i would not consider a normal person's activity and you know Uh, you know what but uh, the other thing that i loved about this blog post is that 15 years ago when i worked with you both um i was advocating for a small messaging technology called mqtt that was still kind Mm -hmm. of mostly largely unknown outside of ibm but but, you know in in a few industrial contexts and um, it was just a delight to me. Every it remains a delight to me every time I see MQTT mentioned in 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 the service of action and and people using it. And he says, you know, oh, yeah, we you know I, we use MQTT for this and simple and easy. And I'm just I love that. You know, I spent a a ton of time back then. I haven't really done anything um, significant to evangelize it in the last fifteen years. Um, and it's just a delight that it took on this life of its own and has been adopted. What's so funny is I actually was talking to somebody at lunch today about MQTT <laughs> and, and, and the fact that you had played a role in it uh, and, and uh, you know, some of the things that we were doing with the auto, in- auto industry. 25 years, years this year uh, since it was created and yeah. invented. So, uh, yeah, it's exciting stuff. Very cool. I also remember the fun things that you had done in the, the Slack bot realm that have similar kind of connotations here where the Slack bot would notice, hey, you're talking about X, Y, and Z. So therefore, yeah. I'll put a snarky result in, which right, but is again, not I mean, nearly as smart as this. But Yeah, exactly. Better. We, we hard coded a list of responses that it would cycle through to, if we <laughs> mentioned a particular thing in, in our chat room. But, but now you could say, oh, you know, Michael is talking about this topic and it's at this time of day and the weather where he is is like that, you know, and you could get a load more context and do something more interesting. So I don't think I I, I find this a, a, a not necessarily useful, but an interesting uh, idea for app- applying these technologies in a non-threatening, non-harmful way. I believe, and um, I think they are genuinely new things that we couldn't do before. And I also have always loved, and a long time loved, the concept of having some kind of personality embodied in an object. Clearly that object doesn't have a personality. It's an inanimate thing, but from everything from little printer with which had to have the little smiley face and print you your news on a, on a sheet of thermal paper to, you know, some of the kind of uh, robotic type desk companions. I, I do think this is really fun. Genuine people, personality profiles or something along those lines. Right. Um, so speaking of of uh of mashing things up uh something that came across my desk and i had can't believe i hadn't seen this before is the heinz remix so this is a box 
that allows the user much in the same way that you can with those Coca-Cola machines of selecting, you know, do I want to mix uh, an orange Fanta kind of mix with uh, a, a diet cherry uh, Coca-Cola and kind of get a new drink out of the whole range. You can do now this sort of thing with a variety of different sauces and create your own specialized ketchup barbecue sauce or other things like that. And I thought this was super I, fun and where AI could be used too, for sure. Yeah. We, I, I remember, you know, at the uh, dining hall in college, uh, kind of doing this on the fly, mm -hmm. right? Cause you had the whole line of different things as you're going through the line and picking stuff up and you kind of go, you put a little ketchup, a little mustard, a little this, a little that, mix it all up and make something out of it. Uh, but yeah, um, seeing this uh, productized uh, with the freestyle device and, and the Heinz device and other ones. Uh, I think I saw one that does, uh, was it coffee drinks or something that does similar to this? And I'll, I'll have to see if I can find it, but I do remember other domains doing this exact same thing. Yeah, I think um, cool. Five Guys in the UK has one of these machines. It, I presume it is the Coca-Cola freestyle that lets you choose different, I guess, mm -hmm. carbonated drink syrups that let you, you know, mix your cherry aid and orange and whatever um, concoction. But yeah, um, it's a fun idea. I'm not sure I would use it, but uh, obviously there's, yep. they found a market for it. And they're also then mining it to figure out what flavors people like so um I, I hope that they're not also then including you know things like facial recognition and whatever else as we saw happen in that canadian <laughs> we saw university that recently one machine. yeah yes right yep. so um, i hope i hope it's done in a way that uh is a bit more sens sensitive to people's uh privacy and preferences and that but yeah Yep. So m moving along the, the spectrum here just a little bit, uh, Michael, you had put into our team chat. I'd actually seen this too, but I was waiting to see if you would do it or someone else would. Well, I, I figured I had to do it because, <laughs> you know, I annoy you guys enough with my, my enjoyment of the Vision Pro. Uh, and uh, this is uh, an actually interesting article from The Verge on etiquette of wearables. Uh, and it's not just this, right? It's It's... Back in the days of the glass hole, uh, the fact that, uh, and I had this happen years ago, uh, my watch was was picking up Siri commands in a meeting with a senior exec at my company. Uh, you know, all these things that make it a disruptive technology. And what is the right usage and the right etiquette for using various variable wearable technology, whether it's a camera, a microphone, a notification device, uh, et cetera, uh, in uh, polite company. I, What'd you guys think? I'm interested in this. And I think that there's a couple of really good examples that the author Victoria Song um, from The Verge mentions where um, she was in formal settings, specifically wedding days, her wedding day and her friend's wedding where she was a bridesmaid, um, wearing a smartwatch, not wanting to wear the smartwatch because it just didn't seem appropriate or whatever. And having taken it off, then having a, a tan line around the wrist, um, caution wearing a vision pro in public, even when alone. Um, and, uh, also referring to the fact that the aura ring, which I wear, um, although mine, I think, is on its last legs, which is another story. Um, you know, whether people would be bothered by the appearance of those in formal photographs or things like that when it's a very passive device. So um, I think the the glasses one is a very different case to the others. Um, there is an argument that says, well, they're wearing, you're wearing a smartwatch. But you should assume that anyone wearing a smartwatch has an always on microphone with them, um, hasn't disabled it. Um, and may or may not pick up and transmit what you're talking about somewhere else. The same applies to not to wearables, although this is stories all about wearables, but going to somebody's house at all store location or whatever, whether they've got smart speakers and, and, and where that, uh, you know, what's being listened to, transmitted and stored elsewhere. Um, I do want to yep. just pick up since you wrote, you raised it, Michael, uh, on the annoyance that you mentioned uh friendly annoyance that you mentioned <laughs> with the vision pro and friendly i'm annoyance. i'm delighted i'll be very clear i'm delighted that you're enjoying yours um i am not going to be getting one in the near future uh one because of availability well you don't have the option uh, one because yeah, of availability but also you know, i i i was talking and thinking about this today um i cannot myself 
even as an early adopter of many things, justify that expense when it's not a computer. Um, I know it wants to be a computer. I know it claims to be a computer. It's not something that I will use every day in the same way that I use a laptop or or other computing device phone. Um, and so far, those things, apart from my car, have been the mo- the top level expense of, of my stuff. So, uh, you know, it's more expensive than an iPad. It's more expensive than a, an, uh, than a it Mac. Is. It's more expensive than all those things. And I can't personally justify that cost yeah. on that device. But I do find it, I use it as much, if not more than And that is a, that is a, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that, but I can't see myself yet. I, I, I haven't tried it. Again, I want to be very clear. I haven't tried it. I struggle to comment on the, the stories because I feel like having not had any, any experience whatsoever. And I know we do this all the time, but you know, not, not yeah. this thing having, clearly having a very different experience to anything I may have had myself in the past. Um, I, I I don't find it easy to put myself in that place. So just to clarify, very friendly uh, rivalry there. Um, yeah, yeah, love that you have yours, and and I'm we've got to have fun. I'm, I'm curious about how uh, uh, how it evolves. Yeah, I'm 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 always amazed at the the the, the number of uh, Kickstarters that I can't join that I see other people joining. It's like oh now yeah, and then I buy this. Yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 I think I can't remember so, what Kickstarter or. Other crowdfunding thing I probably put money into this week that is so you know much less than that, but it's a bit another bit of fun for a gadget that I may or may not use, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm I'm on Team Andy Michael, with this front think? too. Um, I, and I feel the same way, so I don't, I don't think I need to repeat it. It is a friendly thing. I'm glad that you are on the early adopter time frame with us. You you did a similar kind of thing, Michael, as I recall, where you went like full on iPad well in advance of anybody else, right? It's like, I will use this iPad for my day-to-day work and I will make it work and we'll see what happens. And I really admire that about you because that was the intent, right? It's like, how do I make these things really work for me and not just be another piece of glass? Well, let's let's continue down that that line so we can move move along in our playlist here. And Michael Rowe, what do you think of the story that we've seen on Boy Genius Report this week? Um, about the yeah. new Apple Pencil possibly coming uh, with functionality for the Vision Pro. Well, well, we've talked about this, uh, that I, I was expecting a new iPad already, mm. and um, it seems to be now the rumor is May, which is starting to get into the time frame that it gets closer to when the new phones come out, which makes it harder to justify. Um, and uh, I've been on the record, so to speak, that I would love to be able to have my iPad interact with the Vision Pro. Uh, and so what this is, is actually uh, the idea that a new Apple Pencil will be able to use, will interact with the Vision Pro, possibly through the iPad. So suddenly the iPad becomes a tablet in the environment with the new Pencil so that you can actually use the Pencil on a large palette in the virtual space but you're probably drawing on the iPad. It's not a 3D pencil in air. Like, what was the one thing yeah, that we saw? Yeah, it was, ex- it was extruded, extruded like filament. Yeah, it was filament. extruded like a 3D printer mm-hmm. filament, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, th- I find this interesting. I will say that I do have some consistency annoyances, and we talked about this also with the positioning of the cursor with the eyes. Uh, so getting a more fine control with a pencil would be a good thing. Mm. But then again, it's it's taking a 3D environment and trying to put it back onto a 2D tablet in order to interact with the 3D space. So it's interesting. I don't I, I don't know yet. It will be interesting and uh, I'm looking forward to what comes out in June with Vision OS 2 from a beta perspective to see the next jump. But, well, but at this, did, this is 1.0 Didn't right this now. article <laughs> though kind of focus on the idea of using the pencil without the iPad? You don't need the iPad. Yeah, but I, I, I don't grok that yet. And, <laughs> the pencil, having that 3D space, it then becomes just an extension of your finger, and you can already do things with your finger in 3D. Isn't it, is it true that the um, Vision OS 2 uh, is going to unlock the full capability of the current Vision Pro the, to insert spiders onto your eyeballs? I, I think it'll be our best operating system yet. It's the one that's going to unlock our the little cages for the spiders the, the, that live inside the Vision <laughs> yeah, Pro, spiders right? on your eyeballs. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I, I was also thinking about the whole keyboard angle too, because I I had read, yeah. not personally experienced, that can you type in the Vision Pro experience? Sure, on a virtual keyboard, yep. yes. But if you had a keyboard that you actually did type on, that muscle memory you touch can. typing can help you even I, more. And I yeah, know that I, exists today. Yeah, I mean, it exists on the on yeah. the Quest Pro, the Quest um, uh, Two as well. But I'm not um, I'm not sold on it. Um, yeah. The well, I just. I yeah. think it doesn't, you know, the technology in the Quest is not sufficiently good to, to properly achieve what they try to want to do with the pass through and the capabilities around keyboards and other devices. Uh, again, the the attention is the issue, yeah. is where am I looking yeah. so it knows the focus for the, even with the physical keyboard, mm -hmm. I, I find myself going between something up here and then my virtual Mac screen and the cursor will move as I look, and suddenly I'm typing in the wrong space. Oh, but that's software well, fixable. Well, we've been yeah, we've been um, but, spending some some time in the way. last few weeks <laughs> skipping over stuff. So let's try and let's try and push through these last few uh, items here. We've got a couple that are uh, links from uh, social contacts, and I know Michael, you wanted to, Ro, you wanted to talk about this next one that I picked up from Tom Warren uh, about a game that's now available to wishlist it, on Steam. It's very much like using an iPad in a 3D environment, now, right. isn't it? Right. This, yeah. This, so, so, so this is 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 playing a 2D game in a 3D environment while playing the 3D version of the game in that environment. So it's called. It's a game called Screenbound. <laughs> um, the tagline is: "It's a game about being distracted but totally in control." So you you're essentially holding what looks like a a Game, game Boy, Boy inside yeah. of a virtual a world, Boy. and the game that you're playing on the Game Boy screen is the environment you're moving through in the 3D world around you. Um, I kind of love the concept. It's a very unique... Well, no, I don't think it's very unique. I think it's a unique play on this idea. Um, a lot of people's comments on threads that are responding to Tom Warren's uh, post was... Yeah, this is too. This is a step too far, Michael. You were saying it before yeah. the show that you don't think this is a game that you could yeah. deal with. I, I, yeah. I mean, just what I was describing with the cursor moving around me typing in the wrong window. Uh, what I see in this game is the Game Boy blocks content that you can't see that you need to know about in order to do the next step. But, but you can kind of see in two D on the Game Boy. Screen. But also, you can move and, the and my brain thing, just did not rack. But then you can move the three dimensional. You know, you can move the thing around. So, so yeah, you'd end up looking up and down in order to see the thing in front of you. But it would work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it just breaks my brain yeah. trying to play that. <laughs> it does look. It does say that the, the release date hasn't even been announced yet. So it's still like a very much yeah. conceptual idea. There's a video that looks really fun, but I do. I do like the idea of it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's get a little more Fun serious stuff. for a second and talk security for just a moment. Mm -hmm. and, and this note from Brian Krebs over on infosec.exchange was really intriguing. Lots of stories about it this week, dealing with password resets and spoofing your have way either, into. Have either of you had these? So these are uh, no. targeting Apple, nope. users of Apple devices, a um, bunch of messages all showing up in, 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 in once saying, you know, use the phone to reset your ID, Apple ID password that you haven't triggered from another device. So it's kind of like a yep. de denial of service attack on your patience and uh, attention, hoping it seems that you will eventually click on one. Uh, just say, screw and, it. Yeah, okay. and just say, all right, fine. <laughs> um, but rather than spending enough time to recognize it as an attack. But I, I, I do have an angle on this. So um, because of my setting up uh, my mother-in-law's machine, every once in a while, it gets confused and it becomes a trusted device on my developer account. Hmm. Oh. Huh. And so I will try to log in to like App Store Connect or iTunes Connect or something else. And it'll do the pop up on various machines hey. saying approve, get the six digit code, type it in. And it'll show up on her screen screen every once in a while. And and I have done a significant amount of effort to make sure that she understands leave it alone for about 30 seconds mm -hmm. it'll go away if it doesn't go away call me hit deny right just hit deny because it's either me and i'm going to do it within 30 seconds or it's not me and then deny mm. <laughs> don't don't think about it just 30 seconds deny <laughs> oh that's very very so, very uh, smart all right let's let's hit the last two links which are both kind of retro yeah. uh facing 
Uh, one of them being from my friend Wintermute on Mastodon. Very cool. Uh, which Love is showing it. a video, a link to a YouTube video of somebody running uh, Flight Simulator version 4 all the way back in the day on CGA uh, graphics on an IBM PC. Uh, the fact that you can run this on a microcontroller now, which is just wow. Um, and Love not just that. Deal. SimCity, Word, and, and other Fox things. Pro. Fox Pro. Yeah. Um, I used to do Fox Pro development. I love it's, it. It's really impressive to see you know, the capabilities of some of these tiny microcontrollers these days. And the last one, Michael, you shared with us this morning, um, my, from, from my perspective yes. of where we are in the timeline, <laughs> um, which is a Commodore 64 style retro keyboard. Yeah, I, I know both of you like your clickety clackety keyboards. Yeah. I, I, I loved my Commodore 64 back in the day. Uh, and, uh, so now I have the Commodore 64 So, so and I, I have a common, I, 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 I had the portable and I, I have the Commodore 64. I have it converted to a USB keyboard, um, for today's yes. usage. And the keyboard is absolutely terrible. It's, it's the worst thing <laughs> I ever. It. It's got lots it, of, it, it's, it's these big top. Yeah, keys, it's okay. You know, fine. The keys are fine, keys. but the actual keys are fine. But it's, the fact that the keyboard layout yeah. and Content is utterly useless for a oh, modern, that was horrible. modern computing for modern. experience. It's terrible. Uh, so but, you know, but, all they've done this, here is really given it a, really good. They've given it a color scheme mm -hmm. and and the, and the styling, but yeah. that's it. I mean, there's a few other bits. There's a couple yeah. of uh, dials yeah. on there, and it evidently comes with. But it brought me back the action buttons from the uh, the NES styled keyboard and uh, and a joystick as well, which looks fun. Yeah, I agree. It looks cool. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> it, it gives me it gives me it makes me think of my actual Commodore 64 that I was looking forward to using as a keyboard and have found is terrible. Yeah. So, Michael, <laughs> you're not getting one because this is going to make too much of a racket no. for you, right? Correct. Yeah. Plus, okay. you know, can you play Commodore 64 in a <laughs> Vision Pro? Uh, actually, uh, you probably can <laughs> use one of the websites, right? Probably. <laughs> Where you can play the old Commodore probably. 64 games. Yeah. Uh, so be very immersive. Anyway, I I just thought it was a fun uh fun keyboard look and and it brought back fond memories of my C64. All right, we're giving ourselves uh three stars for getting through our full playlist uh this one time Yay. uh without skipping. Uh, <laughs> Never do it again. And, uh, yeah, exactly. There's been so much stuff happening online in the last uh few months that we've been enjoying trying to cram as much as we can in each week. But do come and check out the show notes uh, at gamesatwork.biz on our website or send us a message on Mastodon at games at work underscore biz at botsin.space. And uh, otherwise, I guess that's this, uh, that's it for another show. See ya. See ya. You've been listening to gamesatwork.biz, the podcast about gaming technology and play. We are part of the Blueberry Podcasting Network and would like to thank the band Random Encounters for their song, Big Blue. You can follow us at our website at gamesatwork.biz. 